Hello, um, I'm very pleased to be here talking about some work we've been doing to look at uh, children's language learning using Gorilla. And just to give you a bit of the background as to why I'm interested in this topic, um, I have a long history of working with developmental language disorder, um, which affects children's language development and is a term used for children who have persistent problems with using or understanding language and the problems affect social or educational functioning. Um, and we typically focus on children where there's no obvious biomedical condition that might explain the language problems. And one of the things that becomes clear when you look at the literature on this is that although there are some effective interventions that look at children's expressive language, there's not very much that seems to be effective for improving their receptive language, their comprehension problems. Um, and of course, if we want to devise an effective method, we need to sort of understand the underlying basis of developmental language disorder. And interest in that question has been something that I've work worked on all my research career. Now, there was a very interesting early attempt to use a computerized intervention for uh, children with language problems developed by Paula Talal and colleagues in the US, known as Fast for Word. This was not online, um, initially, although they did do quite a lot subsequently online with it. Um, but it's a, a method that children play all sorts of games uh, designed to boost their language comprehension and particularly designed to get around auditory problems that uh, her theory posited as the basis for developmental language disorder using speech that was been, had been modified to make br brief or low intensity portions more salient. Um, and this has been given to many, many children, and it's a very intensive treatment. It goes on for 90 minutes a day, five days a week for six weeks. So it's a rather massive investment of time to do it. Um, and initially there was huge enthusiasm for it, but then over time it became clear that initial promising results really didn't look so good um, when people were doing proper clinical trials methodology using control groups and reasonable sample sizes. Uh, and a meta-analysis that looked at six high quality trials didn't find any benefit for fast forward over a control group. And this was particularly concerning given the opportunity costs um, in terms of the time taken and the money. And it was really quite disappointing as well because you would have thought that this amount of training um, and very intensive exercises should uh, have some effect. Um, so I was intrigued by this as well as being rather disappointed. And with Stuart Rosen and Caroline Adams in Oxford, my first foray into this area was to sort of try and take this a bit forward, not by looking at Fast for Word itself, which was a fairly complex suite of activities that children did, but rather to just develop a particular game to focus just on one element, sentence comprehension, um, and see how far this acoustic modification that uh, they used made any difference and how far children would learn given repeated trials on something quite simple. And we've written up this study so I won't go into details about it but I think I was really quite surprised at how little children did seem to learn which is consistent with the, the fast for word studies. Um, their ability to improve on understanding quite simple constructions like uh, the dog is above the tree or something like that. They had to move things on the screen to uh, meet the, to, to agree with the sentence. The language learning was slow and it never reached ceiling even when there were no auditory challenges and you had very few very simple reversible sentences but repeated with feedback and so on. And this really had quite a dramatic effect on my whole approach to studying developmental language disorder because I had up till then been very focused on looking at auditory problems and possibly sort of memory problems but not studying learning per se. Um, so I moved on to thinking we should really be looking at learning, but of course this poses real challenges because you're talking about trying to study children over time and, and look at um, possibly performance over a series of days, and that poses a lot of logistic problems. And I was very fortunate that Julie Shu came as a postdoc from Taiwan to work with me on this and put a huge amount of effort into making this work. But again, we still weren't online at this point. So I devised this uh, task where you learned new vocabulary, very similar to the earlier one really that we'd done with um, uh, Stuart Rosen. Julie and I put together this thing where they had a number of trials like this, where you would, this is learning vocabulary. So you would have novel animals that they didn't know the names of, and you would then have to um, 
put the right one, you'd hear a name, you'd have to put the right one in that robot's tummy and you'd get exciting rewards when it, when it worked. And children did show ability to learn on this. Uh, children with language disorders were slower than, uh, were not, they weren't slower. In fact, their rate of learning was equivalent to older children, but they started from a lower point, which was quite interesting. They were really very like younger, typical children on this task. Uh, we also came back to sentence comprehension, which I've always been interested in, uh, using very simple spatial prepositions like the eye is above the boot, and they would again have to pick the two named items and put them in the right spatial position, and when they got it right, very exciting things happened to keep them going over many trials. But here again, um, rather like with the earlier studies, what surprised me was that although children could improve up to a certain point, they didn't get fluent on this, um, the children with language disorders. For older typical children, this was, they were performing at ceiling on this and it seemed very easy. Um, and it was really quite surprising how younger children and children with language disorders would just sort of stabilize at a level 85% correct perhaps. Uh, so they were above chance, they weren't just guessing, but they never seemed to really automatize the understanding of above and below or similar types of prepositions. So from this, what did I learn? Well, that there are huge advantages of using computerized tasks. They can be made into this sort of fun game-like format, which means you can then deliver many trials in a short period of time. And they're really ideal for studying learning. Um, and also, um, I was very conscious that if we could get this right, we might be able to develop some sort of intervention uh, that really optimized the learning conditions to really ensure that children did start to learn. But at the moment, the way we were doing it, it didn't seem that we had done that. Um, these studies, though, were still really hard to do. And I was fortunate to have long term funding from Wellcome Trust because these sorts of studies took always much longer than we anticipated. Quite apart from having to program and devise a task that could take months to get right by piloting it with children and seeing what they wouldn't, wouldn't do. Um, it took a very long time to recruit and test children. So it took us three years to recruit and test 76 children, um, including language disordered children. And a lot of problems involved working around school timetables, especially when you wanted to repeatedly test children over several days. So I got very interested in the possibilities offered by online testing, where it's much easier to pilot tasks. You can post a task online and try it out on a small sample. It's easier to recruit, although it may be harder to find children who have particular characteristics. And there's always a concern that you may get a biased sample of just the children of middle class parents. Um, home administration makes for more flexibility for repeated testing, but of course there are concerns about lack of quality control, uh, possibility of parents interfering, background noise, distractions and so on. Um, but we thought it was worth giving this a shot. And so we were able to adapt essentially a version of the Sue and Bishop task to the Gorilla platform. And it was very opportune that Nicole Tanley Ning from Singapore came to do a project with me um, at this time. And Adam Parker, who is a wizard doing guerrilla things, uh, was also able to supervise and was responsible for a lot of the good things that we did here. Um, so the initial project was to develop and pilot the tasks um, to see whether we could show learning in typically developing children using one simple manipulation. Um, this was really just something I'd always been curious about uh, when we did our earlier studies. What was the optimal way to present the tasks? Would it be better to just bang away on one particular task or set of materials or interleave things? Would that make it more interesting or would it confuse children? Um, so we con compared an interleaved and blocked condition using the two sorts of materials that we'd used before, so vocabulary learning or simple sentence understanding. And Nicole managed to recruit 96 typically developing children aged between six and 10, and we got 56 of them who completed 80 or more trials on this so that we could look at learning over blocks of trials. And the interleaving effect that we were interested in um, is just illustrated here that you can either have a task where you alternate items or where you put them in blocks and in fact the way we did this was we had blocks of 10 so either within a block you would have um, alternated vocabulary sentence vocabulary sentence or you would have all vocabulary and then a block of all sentence comprehension 
Um, and I won't go into the theory of why we thought this was interesting, but there's quite a lot of work on blocking versus interleaving um, that gave us reason to think this might have some benefits or not. And we had devised this treasure hunt game. Uh, you had 96 participants and we divided them into uh, two subsets uh, who this was a between subjects design with interleaved or block sequences and we measured their reaction times and how often they made mistakes. I'll just try and show you the game I'll just explain what you're going to see if we if the video works. Um, there's a cover story the child is exploring a cave for treasure um, and they have to solve clues to advance through the cave which is responding on the screen. Um, and we had a set of different levels. So Nicole is a keen gamer and was very good at advising what sorts of things might make it look more like a regular game. Uh, and the child, children would get rewards and sounds when they got a correct response. And they can see these accumulate, so there's some motivation to keep going. Right at the end, they can earn a scroll, which they could save as a PDF, which is shown here on the right. Um, and the whole approach, as always with our other tasks, is an errorless learning one. So if you get it wrong, nothing happens other than that things just uh, pop back to where they were to start with. So uh, you have another chance to have another go. But we would treat that as an error in our coding. But the child, from the child's point of view, they just keep going till they get it right and then they get a reward. So they always get a reward at the end. Um, things are placed in a grid. This was an interesting idea from Joe Evershed. Uh, because it means that you can then constrain task difficulty in various ways. You can either get the child to move just one thing into one place in a grid that's open, or you can have several spaces. And with some of these sentence items, then we could ask children to put them in spatial configurations. So I'll try and show you a demo that is just going to show you a transition from the first to the second level with interleaved presentations where you've got vocabulary and prepositions alternating. Um, let's see. So this, you're seeing this from the point of view of the person responding. The hen is below the bed. Cayman. So that's, Cayman. A, that's an error. So nothing happens except it goes back and then they get it right. And then they get the reward. This is just moving from one level to the next. The bell is above the heart. You can see it's, it's self-paced by the child. They have to press that question mark. Aye, aye. Aye, aye. Aye, aye. And that's, I think, probably as much as we're going to see. But uh, I'll go to the next slide. Um, this is just a rough uh, designation of how we got on with it. Um, what we've got here on the left are the accuracy scores. I've divided into, we weren't particularly planning to look at age, but we divided into above and below eight years for this plot. Just so you can see that the, the older children do do better than the younger, as you might expect. But basic message is that, you know, both accuracy, the number of attempts that they need goes down with time. Uh, this is on the vocabulary items and the reaction time also speeds up uh, over the over the blocks. But um, there's actually uh, not any difference, uh, significant difference between the um, interleaved or blocked trials here, although it may look like there's a bit of difference on the slopes. What we did to study this was to just subtract the uh, either accuracy uh, from the block, fourth block and the first block to see how much change there'd been, or uh, look at the slope on the reaction time uh, computed individually for children between those blocks. Um, and we didn't find, the bottom line is that we found that there was learning, but we didn't find any main effect of condition. So currently we're doing work now uh, to try and take this forward. We feel that was a sort of proof of principle that we can get a game. Children did mostly enjoy doing it. Some of them wanted to do even more. Um, and I think, you know, the reinforcements and things that we put in. Um, so we want to now try this with children who have language disorders again. We want to see if we can replicate a finding that we got with Julie Shu, where um, there's a sort of heb effect on this sort of task, whereby if you get this, exactly the same sentence um, repeated throughout on 
alternate items. So you can see over here on the right, you can have sentences A, B, C, and D that recur through the block. Um, does that uh, help or hinder their learning? And we did find that that was specifically helpful for language impaired children in our study, but it was a finding that really de needed replication. Um, but there's certainly scope for taking this forward. Um, the main thing I, I would say is that we showed that systematic studies of training with children are really much more feasible with these online computerized methods because you can really start to do several days of training if you can get the child interested enough to want to do it. Um, but it, making the task attractive and game-like is as important as getting the experimental design right. The sounds are at least as important as the visuals in providing motivation. That's just an anecdotal observation. It would be quite interesting to do a study actually on that. Um, but we found that children sort of came alive once they started getting these tinkly noises and things. Um, there's scope for manipulating task conditions in all sorts of ways to try and find out what does optimize learning for children um, and to customize the task to the child's ability level. But um, there's a warning from history that we need to be very careful about sort of getting overexcited and taking this into clinical applications or educational applications until we've really done enough research to be clear on what is and is not effective because it's clear that these sorts of comprehension problems I'm interested in are really tough uh, to uh, if influence um, and just because kids like playing a game and it looks as if they're learning doesn't necessarily mean that this is going to be superior to other sorts of uh, activities they might be doing in school. So we've got to be careful about that. Thanks for listening. Oh, and I should say that I, I had a little plug at the end for uh, a talk to, at the EPS on Thursday um, by Adam Parker um, on how we're using Gorilla for looking at um, lateralization of various activities. So uh, the, we, found we were able to devise a reliable online behavioral laterality task.